Well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so there's this, maybe you know, there's this famous uh, short story by Edgar Allan Poe called The Purloined Letter, where somebody steals a letter and it's hidden, and the police are looking for it, and it turns out to have been hidden in plain sight. And so what I want to talk about today has a kind of a similar flavor to it. So there was some conjectures. So about 30 years ago, Mark Green and others made some conjectures about algebraic curves. And then the big progress was maybe 10 years ago by Claire. And there, the, the, the famous conjecture was Green's conjecture on canonical curves. But there was a kind of a little brother conjecture about to the effect that you could read off the canality, what degree maps the curve admitted from the projective resolution of its ideal sheaf. Then about a year ago, it turned out uh, Lawrence Hahn and I realized that by a tiny little variant of the methods that Claire used in her work on canonical curves, this thing kind of popped out. So it, it, somehow what happened is it, it turned out that this thing was hidden in plain sight after all. So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to show you the purloined uh, conjecture, I guess it is. So OK, so we're going to uh, deal with uh, curves today. So let's let C be a smooth projective curve of genus G, or let's say over C. So at a certain point, uh, we want to work in characteristic 0. And we're going to be interested in uh, large degree embeddings of this curve. So L or LD will be a line bundle on C of degree D. And let's make D at least 2G plus 1. So this means that um, this line bundle is very apple, and so it defines, it defines an embedding of C into a projective space of dimension R. So this is the, we'll always look at the complete embedding, and we're in the range where r is determined by just the degree. So it's d minus g. OK, and so the idea is that back in the early 1980s, Mark Green realized that you can see results about classical results about equations defining curves, or for that matter, other varieties. You should see these results as the first cases of more general results about higher, more general statements about higher syzygies. So uh, uh, let me start. So what, what, are the, 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 what is the sort of the classical picture? So the classical picture here is as the degree of the embedding line bundle grows, the algebraic properties of C get nicer and nicer. So classically, what uh, people understood is that if D is at least 2G plus 1, which we're assuming, that means that uh, this embedding defines a projectively normal, this line bundle defines in a projectively normal embedding. So sections of tensor powers of L are given by symmetric products of the sections of L. And then when you go up to uh, at least 2G plus 2, uh, the classical result is that the homogeneous ideal of C in this projective space is generated by quadrics, by elements of degree 2. And, uh, but people never really asked themselves, well, what happens starting at 2G plus 3? And what Mark Green realized is you should uh, generalize this whole story to, the, to higher syzygies. So generalize to syzygies. So uh, for better or for worse, there's a certain amount of notation that's needed for this story. So let me introduce uh, a first piece of it now. So. Uh, what the idea was, you want to essentially look at syzygies, the projective resolution of this homogeneous ideal. So uh, let's let S be the symmetric algebra on the space of sections of L. So that's the homogeneous coordinate ring of this uh, projective space. And uh, then I want to look at the graded ring uh, associated to L. So this is going to be the sum of all the sections of all of multiples of L. And this is an, an algebra, but actually all we care about is that it's a module over this S. So it's a graded S module. It's a finitely generated graded S module. And then like any finitely generated graded module, you can look at the projective resolution of this R. So let me, uh, I think the, the, the pros, which I'm really not, but they go from left to right. So let's see if I can do that. So you take this ring R, has a certain number of generators. Write them as A0, J. So this I'll call E0. This is the first piece of the resolution. Then I look at the uh, relations among these and so on. A1, J. 
different index, index set j's. And in this case, the length of the resolution is r minus 1. So we go up to s minus a r minus 1 j. OK. And I'll call this e1, just to give a name, e2, e r minus 1. So this, OK. OK, so this is uh, the resolution. Now, in our situation, we're going to assume that this, this L is, uh, we're in the situation where L is normally generated. So that means that this ring only has one generator. So in our situation, uh, so when E naught is just uh, S, as it is in over, so let me, let me say this differently, sorry. Uh, when L is normally generated, as it is necessarily in our situation, then there's only uh, then there's only one generator, so E naught is S. So we can just get rid of all the generators here except the one in degree zero. And then the kernel of this map is just the homogeneous ideal of the curve. So in that case, the rest of the resolution is just a resolution of the ideal. And in this case, uh, when is the, so in the, the, the first classical condition is this, in this, this space of generators just has, it occurs just in one degree. And then when is the rest of the resolution is in the resolution of the ideal. So when is it generated by quadrics? Well, that just means that all the generators of this first module of syzygies have degree two. So in this case, so in this case, uh, the next piece is as simple as possible. So E1 is just a sum of S minus twos uh, if and only if the ideal is generated by quadrics. Okay, so what Mark Green realized is that then the way you should try to generalize these classical results is you should ask when is the next term in the resolution as simple as possible, and then the next term after this. And so he proved uh, a theorem about this. So let me state his theorem, and it says just what you might think it says. It says that as the degree increases, uh, more and more of these pieces of the resolution just become linear. So what he showed is that. Uh, if 1 is less than or equal to p is less than or equal to the degree of the line bundle minus 2g plus 1, let me make sure I have this right, yes, then uh, the p piece of this resolution, p sub p, is just a, uh, all the generators occur in degree minus p, or occur in degree p plus 1. So, uh, if p is equal, this starts when d is equal to 2g plus 2. So when d is equal to 2g plus 2, it says that, uh, so then we can take p equal 1, and then it says that uh, e1 is just a direct sum of s minus 2. So that's the classical fact that the ideal is joined by quadrics. The first non-classical case occurs when um, p is equal to 2g plus 3. So what does Green's theorem say when p is equal to 2g plus 3? So, for, uh, so if d is equal to 2g plus 3, then we can apply this theorem with p equals 2. And it says that the relations among the quadrics are generated by syzygies with linear coefficients. So what this says concretely, uh, it says that, uh, let me just say a little bit vaguely, the relations among quadratic generators of the ideal are generated by syzygies of weight 1. So we're spanned by relations of the form, by relations, summation, relations of the form, summation L alpha. Let me call the quadratic generators Q alpha. So these are spanned by relations of the form L alpha Q alpha equals 0, where the degrees of the L alphas are 1, so that the relations are spanned by syzygies of weight 1. And so on. If you go up to 2g plus 4, the relations among the relations would be given by linear coefficients, and so on and so forth. OK. And so this generated a lot of interest, and it's been generalized in many directions. For example, the classical results for curves had been studied for a billion varieties by Mumford and Kempf and Korizumi, and Pereshki and Popa have generalized these green type results for a billion varieties. But what I want to focus on today is kind of the fine structure for curves. That's the plan. Now, um, there's a more general question you can ask, 
Uh, and it's going to turn out to be important to sort of introduce a second variable. So more generally, uh, le let's let B be any line bundle. So take uh, any line bundle on the curve. And then we can uh, form a module uh, so we can look at R of B semicolon L. So this is going to be the direct sum of H naught of B plus ML. So this is not an algebra anymore, but it's a module. I can multiply sections of B sections of L. So this is a module over the same uh, symmetric algebra, same S. And then we can look at the syzygies of uh, this thing. Maybe I'll keep this up for one more minute. Uh, so we can again form the resolution of this module R over L. And again, we get these uh, EIs, and we can look at their various properties. So uh, OK, so we can uh, we get, as before, we get a resolution E dot equal E dot of B with respect to L as above. Uh, and again, we can, we can look at its, its properties. And what are, there two, what are the main cases? So there are going to be two main cases. So, uh, so B equals just the trivial line bundle. So that's, where we, that's the classical case that we looked at before. And it's also going to be important to look at B as the canonical line bundle. So in this case, you're looking at the, the what used to be called the arborella cernese module. So you're looking at sections of K plus ML as a module over M, and you'd like to understand its algebraic properties. It can be any integer, but of course L is positive. So I'm, thi I'm thinking of D, well D is at least 2G plus 1. So this is finitely generated. B can be negative, doesn't. Yeah, yeah, that's going to come Yeah, absolutely, that's going to come up. But you'll see, it's important to somehow decouple the B. One of the, again, one of the, the places, I mean, it's going to be important kind of conceptually to decouple the B from the L, as we'll see. OK. Now, um, there's a certain more amount of further notation and definition. So let me give this now. So here's some notation and definitions. So we're basically going to want to look at multiplicity modules for these syzygy groups. So it's what people call uh, Kazuo cohomology groups. So without giving a very formal definition, let me just say that this is a vector space of, uh, well, let me be a little bit vague about it, of degree uh, P plus Q generators of this pth module of pth vector module of syzygies. So you can think of these as kind of pth syzygies of weight q. I'm not sure this is completely com weight completely standard notation or not, but that's what we'll call them. So this the, you should these are really just multiplicity <laughs> modules. So what this really means is that uh, so if we take this pth thing here, it's just the sum over q of these kpqs tensor over the ground field S minus P minus Q. So it's just like that. And again, the, fun the indexing is a little bit funny, but hopefully eventually it will become clear why people do it this way. So uh, what is, in terms of these KPQs, what does Green's theorem say? So uh, what Green, the, the indexing is, is uh, rigged so that these syzygies that here all have weight one. So what Green's theorem says uh, in terms of this language, uh, says in terms of this language that uh, for p in this range uh, d minus 2g plus 1, then you only get syzygies of weight 1. Then kpq for the trivial line bundle equals 0 for q not equal to 1. So you only get syzygies of weight 1. OK, so what's the basic question we're trying to, we'd like to understand here uh, is we'd like to understand basically what it, what's the grading of these resolutions. 
when L gets very large. OK, so the basic question here that I want to address, uh, so the problem, is we're going to fix a B and then let the degree of L get very large. And then the question is, uh, so fix B and let, and let D, which is the degree of L, be very large. So this is one of the reasons I want to decouple them. So for fixed B and very positive L, then the question is, what's the grading of this resolution? So when is KPQ of B and L 0 or non-zero? Let's say non-zero or zero. OK. OK, so that's the, the basic question. Now, um, again, going, right, going back to the original, uh, to Green's original work in the early 80s, much of this story was worked out right at the beginning. So let me tell you uh, what's kind of known from the start, so syzygies of curves of large degree. OK, so, uh, okay, so there, there, there are some, as I say, most of the picture was, uh, has been understood for a long time. So this is, ba the important stuff here is green, but it's, let's say, green and other. So it's, uh, and again, much of this holds for in suitably modified in all dimensions. But anyway, uh, so again, we fix B, and then we let D, the degree of the line bundle, get very large. And then for very large D, what can we say? OK. So maybe I'll go to uh, there are sort of three statements here. Uh, so the first is you never get syzygies of weight um, three or higher. So the first statement okay, is that these KPQs are 0 for Q greater or equal to 3. So you only get syzygies of weight 0, 1, and 2. You can't get syzygies of weight minus 1 because if L is very positive and you fix B, you're not going to, once you twist negatively by L, nothing is there. Then the more important things is that, so you get syzygies of weight 0, 1, and 2. And in general, the lowest weight and the highest weight syzygies are completely controlled, at least when they're 0 and non-zero. So um, the KP0 of B, let me write it like this, and LD is non-zero if and only if, so let's see, what is it? So P is in between 0 and the project R, R of B. So in other words, the number of sections of B minus 1. So if you fix B and let the D get very large, you know exactly when you get gener uh, weight 0 syzygies. And then so that's h, you know, the projective dimension. So it's h naught of b minus 1. So uh, this will come up h naught b. So it's the projective dimension of, R, of b. And similarly, uh, you can completely control the weight 2 syzygies. So the statement, it's a similar statement. So kp2 of b LD is non-zero. Again, it's if and only if. OK, so let's see what it says here. Uh -huh. So it gets so R of D, that's, the, I'll say what that is in a minute, minus 1 minus the projective dimension of KC minus B should be less than or equal to P, should be less than or equal to R sub D minus 1. And R sub D is my number of sections. It's the projective dimension of L. So it's just D minus G. It's, a num it's R of L. OK, so we completely control the weight 0 and the weight 2 syzygies. And in general, in high dimensions, you always control. Uh, yeah, let's, we'll come back to that. Sometimes, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, let me. So there's an alternating sum that you can control the dimension of. But let, let's, yeah. OK, so let's see what this says. So let, let's work this out in the case of uh, in the two cases, so let's do the case B equals O of C. So here's my first example, uh, O of C. So let's see what this says. So then, so K is 0, 0, that's just generators of the homogeneous coordinate ring of C. So that's just one dimensional as it happens. And then there are no other generators. Uh, so K 
kp0 equals 0 for p bigger than 0. So that's the statement 2. And what does statement 3 say in this case? So let's see. Statement 3, so, it's, so kp2 is non-zero, if and only if what? OK, so let's see what it says. So um, we have to take b equals 0. So this is d minus g, and this is g minus 1. So d minus g minus 1 minus g minus 1. Anyway, I think if you work it out, <laughs> you'll see you get uh, the lower bound is d minus 2g is less or equal to p is less or equal to d minus uh, g minus 1, r minus 1. OK, so these, uh, there's a way that people like to, uh, people, like to they, people who do this like to tabulate this information in what, what are these little diagrams. So let me show you how these diagrams. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's going to come up, right? Yeah, they're exactly dual to each other. Yeah, so we're right. In fact, yeah, whenever it's not covered by Green's theorem, then the, yeah. So let me, let me draw the picture, right, because I'll show you where Green's theorem comes from. But th these are rather general statements. I mean, they're analogous things in higher dimensions, too. The, the non-trivial thing is actually, uh, in this case, it's the th statement three. But anyway, let's see. So here, here, people like to draw a table. These are, so I have to confess, it's taken me 30 years to make my peace with these tables, although I've, done <laughs> I've worked on some other projects in the meantime. But in any event, uh, it's not the only thing. What you do is you draw a little table with p and q, and there's three values of q we, we might be interested in. And then here we're going to, these are the, so these are syzygies of weight 0, weight 1, weight 2. And let's draw the relevant p, 0, 1. Let's see, then I want to do d minus 2g, which is r minus g. And then I keep on going, and the table ends. So the last possible value of p is uh, r minus 1, which is d minus g minus 1. And the thing that people like to do for reasons that are not totally clear to me, we'll write a star to mean is non-zero, write a dash to mean is equal to 0. OK, this is just what people do. So what does the second statement say? It says, and we'll, we'll put the, let me make a little more room here. So here we get one dimension. So it's, I don't know, I'll just put star here. And then everything else on the top row is 0. And then uh, what does it say about the bottom row? So what this says, uh, let me put, uh, what this statement 3 says is that everything on the bottom row is 0 because this is, remember, this is non-zero if and only if. So these are all 0, except starting here, I get. I get exactly g spaces on the bottom where it's non-zero. And so that's what the general theorems give. So notice that a priori, they don't say anything. These general theorems don't say anything about weight 1 syzygies. But of course, I mean, you've got to have a third syzygy of some degree. So the point is that where you know everything else is 0, you must get syzygies of weight 1, and nothing else can occur. So the corollary of this is that, uh, so since you completely control the 0 and 2 syzygies, the corollary is that if 1 is less than or equal to p is less than or equal to d minus 2g minus 1, then you must get weight 1 syzygies, and only kp1 occurs. But b is 0 in this case. b is o. Oh. So it's, it's 0 in this case. Yeah, I'm doing that. OK, so what it's, this happens to be 0. It's not guaranteed. But so what this is saying here is that we must get non-zero syzygies in weight 1, and nothing else happens. And this is actually Green's theorem. And this is, in fact, how more or less how he proved his theorem. He proved, essentially, that you get vanishing real, everywhere else you might get stuff. OK. Yeah, we fix b, and then we let d get very large compared to d, or compared to b. So b is always fixed, and then we're working asymptotically in d. We'll come to that. Yeah, so this stuff is actually, I think, like, I forget where, maybe 3g, 4g. Yeah, we'll come to that. 
OK, so this is what comes out of the general stuff. But you see, what we don't know is, what's, what, we don't know is what happens in these remaining spaces. So nothing says that you can't get syzygies of two degrees simultaneously. So that's, uh, let's see, maybe I'll put this here. So the question then, uh, and this is really the question we're going to be interested in, is, uh, so the question then we're going to be interested in is these mystery groups. So that's really the new point. So question, when is KP1 non-zero, or uh, do I want to say, yeah, KP1 non-zero in this mystery range? for uh, in this range d minus 2g less than or equal to p d minus g minus 1. So again, the general theorems don't by themselves say anything about syzygies of weight 1, but you can deduce things about syzygies of weight 1 if you know that nothing else is present. But OK, so let's do the second example. And everybody, I think <laughs> the cat's been let out of the bag several times already. but. Let's write it down, do it anyway. So the other case is, uh, which is really dual to this, when B is the canonical bundle. So let's see what that says. So, OK, so let's take B to be the canonical bundle. OK, and so what does the general theorem say? Well, if you just look at this, what you find is that then uh, KP0 is non-zero for the first p values of g. And uh, kp2 is non-zero just in one for one value of p. OK, so let's again draw the picture, draw the table. OK, so let's, OK, so here we have p Q, we have 0, 1, 2. Let's see, here we go 0, 1. The interesting case is here g minus 1, g, and then we go up to uh, g minus d minus r minus 1. OK, so here we get g values of uh, p for which we get syzygies of weight 0, and everything else is 0. Here we just get one value of p when we get syzygies of weight 2. Uh, and everything else is zero. It's d minus g. It's r minus one, right? Okay, does that seem better? I mean, g, it, we're embedding in dimension. I mean, d mi g minus d. Okay. And so, okay. And then again, uh, so again, we get the corollary that where everything else is zero, we're sure to get stuff of weight one. And in fact, we don't get anything here. And now there's a mystery region here. So uh, let's see, maybe let me put this over here. So the corollary as before is uh, uh, just as before. So the corollary as before is that uh, so kp1 of kc ld is definitely non zero for. Uh, What's the range here? P between G and, well, oh, G minus 2. So as we can say again, but the theorem doesn't say anything about the remaining ones. OK. Now, as you've has been pointed out, these are really the same diagram. So they're, these diagrams are rotates of each other. I always thought they were reflections, but then Okunkoff pointed out that they really rotates. But in any event, these are the same information. And that's because these groups are dual to each other. So. There's some duality. There's just zero duality. And so what duality says in general is that KPQ of, let's say, B with respect to L is, is dual to, I mean, the numbers don't matter, but it's R minus 1 minus P on a curve 2 minus Q of K minus B with respect to L. So these guys are dual. So these are really the same. I mean, one diagram is just a rotate of the other diagram. It's shared duality. I mean, look, this is computing the x. This, is, this, this isn't. This is an FAC. Uh, anyway, I think it is. Anyway, I'll sh later on. There are no diagrams. I, I, 
but these, these are basically computing some exts of the canonical module. I mean, when you take, when you resolve the ideal and then you flip it around, you're I, I'll, I'll say it again. When I, when I write down how you compute these things later on, I can There are many ways of seeing this. But anyway, so this is a, a general fact. Well, then there'll be some self, but, but yeah, but there's an asymmetry here. Be careful, there's an asymmetry here. So my B is fixed and my L is very positive. So there's an asymmetry built. I mean, I want to take, uh, L isn't going to be a theta characteristic. Oh, yeah, 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 I could do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It what? Then it would be symmetric, right. Well, uh, no, 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 be, car be, car be careful because, like, just wait, you'll see. Because, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, if I get there, right. OK, so the question we had asked earlier was when are these syzygies? So this is kind of the most classical case. These are the syzygies of the homogeneous ideal. So if you want to know when these weights, one syzygies are 0 or non-zero, so the question is equivalent to uh, so question is equivalent to uh, the sort of, let me say, question prime. OK, so question prime is uh, when are these syzygies non-zero? So uh, when is, is kp1 of the canonical, oh, well, yeah, let me say it like this, kc and ld non-zero for very large d. So that's it. It's the same question. OK. And again, um, Mark Green had actually started to look at this question in his original paper. So uh, what did he show? OK. So, well, okay. so what he, he observed, again, uh, so what he observed, again, we fix, uh, we let d be very large, that uh, for d very large, so uh, the first thing is, let's see, so 1, k, 0, 1. So it's all, this is, I'm going to look at the canonical bundle 1. This you'll see, for reasons will become clear, this is the one I look at. So kc of uh, ld is always 0. So what that means concretely, just in plain English, so to speak, is that a, the map from h naught of k, let me assume, did I forget whether I assume the genus is at least 2, but let me do that here, h naught of k tensor h naught of L maps on to h naught of k plus L. So that's saying that this is surjective. And so what that means is that, in general, this spot is always 0. Or the, anyway, the one, the last question mark over there is always 0. But now the first uh, kind of interesting thing happens when you look at k11. So now it's not always 0. It's sometimes zero and it's sometimes non-zero, but it's non-zero. So as as Kuznetsov said, if there's going to be one kind of funny curve, of course it's going to be the hyperelliptic ones. So if and only if uh, C is hyperelliptic. Okay. So um, what that means? Let's see. I can put a little. Uh, so this spot here is sometimes zero, sometimes not zero, but the question is whether or not there exists uh, a, a degree two map from C to P1. Okay, so that governs whether or not that spot is zero. Okay, now, um, these, 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 you know, these, this kind of story came up in the early 80s when Mark Green had kind of made his famous uh, conjecture on canonical curves. So that the conjecture there was that um, you should be able to read off the grading of the resolution of a canonical curve from uh, what's called its Clifford index. So some slightly complicated way of looking at the linear, the special linear series. But the important thing about that conjecture is that it sort of it really was the first time that people kind of thought that you should be able to see geometry in these syzygies. And so he and I kind of looked at this, and then the question was, well, since you have this kind of simple case here, could you, could you hope to sort of see a, a similar pattern if you look at higher syzygies? And so there's an elementary uh, remark that you can make here. 
So the way these conjectures on syzygies works is usually easy to go from special geometry to special syzygies. So the, what's elementary, so you might ask, like, what happens if the curve is, has a 3 to 1 map to P1? And so what he and I, what's elementary, is suppose uh, that there exists a map from C to P1 of degree, what do I want to say, uh, less, than P, less than or equal to P plus 1. OK, then what's easy to see is that then you get a funny syzygy. So then uh, Kp1 of the canonical bundle respect to Ld is non-zero. Again, let's say for very large, it may, it may be for, no, I guess very large d. And you could say exactly what d has to be here. So for example, the next spot there, if there exists it's a degree 2 map, a degree 3 map to p1, then you can produce a syzygy. And there are lots of ways to, uh, to see this. For example, one way to see this is if you look at the corresponding statement for the homogeneous ideal, supposing there's a 3 to 1 map of your curve to p1. So then you get this p1 worth of divisors of degree 3. Well, if you embed your curve with a very large degree, these divisors of p these degree 3 divisors will span p2s, so your curve lies on a surface scroll. And then you can people know what is the resolution of the surface scroll, and that produces long linear things. So anyway, this is this is kind of easy to see. So anyway, so the question then arose, well, there wasn't really much evidence, but anyway, the question then arose, well, maybe the converse is true. So uh, we conjectured this, and it later uh, people, I'm not sure that we necessarily took the conjecture too seriously. But anyway, later on, when people looked at it, it became known as the Ganality conjecture. So the Ganality conjecture was, is that the converse statement is true. So conversely, if you, have, uh, if you do not have a pencil, then you do not have syzygies. So the Ganality conjecture is the converse statement. So if d is sufficiently large, um, then it should be if and only if. So then k p1 of kc ld is non-zero uh, if and only if, well, the ganality of c. So the ganality of a curve, by definition, is the least degree of a map to p1 is less than or equal to p plus 1. So what that meant is that if you take any large, you, take, you have your curve, and you take any one sufficiently large degree embedding of the curve, then you should be able to read off the ganality of the curve by looking at the grading of the resolution of the homogeneous idea. OK. No. And so this was always supposed to be the little, if you know Mark's canonical curve conjecture, which I'm, this was always supposed to be the little brother of that, because the idea is it has to be governed by ganality and not Clifford index. So you know what you're looking for. I mean. <laughs> So one of the problems with the Green's conjecture on canonical curves is you can't imagine what the second to last line of a proof would be. But here the second to last line of a proof would be, therefore it has a map to P1 of degree <laughs> less than or equal to. So it, somehow this always, had to be, this always had to be easier than that, because you knew what you were looking for. OK. And so what this predicts in terms of the, um, so what this predicts in terms of the homogeneous ideal, which is maybe, uh, so it predicts, if I hope I have the numbers right. But if I've got the numbers right, it, it, it predicts that if you look at the syzygies of the homogeneous ideal, which is to say the OC, then this should be non-zero. That, that middle row stops basically at R minus the ganality. So if and only if, for a large degree, P is less than or equal to R minus the ganality of C. OK. So OK, so um, then. Of course, the big advance in all these questions was Claire's work, Claire Voisin's work on general canonical curves. And then using the computation she made for canonical curves, uh, she and Aprodu proved this canality conjecture kind of generically. So what Claire and Aprodu proved, let me, I'm not going to state the most general thing they proved, but essentially what they proved using her computations for canonical curves is, uh, uh, and Voisin, uh, they proved they proved that it's whole. It's true. Let's say proved for generic uh, proved uh, for general curve of each genus of each gonality general curve of each gonality. Okay. 
OK. So what are the results? So the results um, that I want to discuss, so these are with, except for the variant, these are uh, with I. So, so I'll state two theorems. So uh, the first theorem, so basically what the first theorem, so we can, the, I want to explain exactly when these KP1s of B with respect to LD are non-zero. So here's the theorem. So we fix some B and an index P uh, beginning equal to 1. And then I want to say, when is KP1 of B with respect to LD non-zero for very positive D? So then uh, KP1 of B with respect to LD, how do I want to state this? Uh, is e I'll say when it's equal to 0 for a very large D, if and only if. So if and only if uh, B is what people call P very ample. So if and only if. So this should happen uh, if and only if. Let me write it. If and only if B is what's called, I didn't make this up, uh, P very ample, which means what? So that means if you take any effective divisor of degree P plus 1 on your curve, it should impose independent conditions on the sections of B. So if and only if, uh, so IE, so IE, what this means by definition is that for all effective divisors C of degree P plus 1 on the curve, uh, the map from global sections of B, and I evaluate them on the points of this divisor, this should be surjective. All. So it, the, the, these p plus this divisor degree p plus one should impose independent conditions on sections of B, and it's called p very ample because if p equals one, this is the same thing as very ample. So two very ample would mean that for any three points, B embeds them as a as a what as a two plane. Okay. So the claim is that this is if and so for if you fix a B and a p, then for sufficiently large D, this group vanishes if and only if this p is this B is p very ample. Uh, again, if it's not p very ample, it's easier to see that that doesn't vanish. So the interesting question is to see that if that does vanish. Uh, 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 let me. So let's see how this. Um, so it's well understood that this implies the ganality conjecture. So let's see how this goes. Um, see, and this is why it's kind of important. Why it's important. Well, you'll see why it's important to separate the to decouple the b from the l. So okay. So what do we need to prove for the ganality conjecture? So the important thing is to show that if this group is non-zero, a non-zero syzygy gives a non-zero linear series, a, a special a funny linear series. So let's suppose that this, uh, uh, that this KP1 of the canonical bundle LD is non-zero for a very large D. OK. Is non-zero, yeah. Um, so what does the theorem say? So its theorem says with b equal to the canonical bundle, it must fail. This condition must fail. So what this means is so there exists a divisor of degree, C, of degree p plus 1 uh, that doesn't impose independent conditions uh, on the canonical linear series. So we're taking b equals k, not imposing independent conditions on the canonical linear series. But now, this is what's special about the canonical linear series. As soon as you have a divisor that doesn't impose independent conditions, then by Riemann rock it moves in a pencil, at least. So then uh, R of C is at least 1, so it defines the map to P1 of degree of most P plus 1. So the case B equals, and again, it was quite well understood that this is what you'd want to prove for this. Um, and so in general, what the theorem says is that then, since we already understand for large D, we already understand the KP0 and the KP1s, then we, the KP2s, then we now, one now has a complete understanding of the, you know, the grading of the resolution of any, um, of any, um, of any B. Now, as somebody, uh, the question, of course, arises, can you do this effectively? 
And so in our paper, we had given com some kind of crazy bound. But then Jürgen Rothman, who was a student of Hartshorn, who then went into banking, uh, saw the paper. And I think he's still in banking, but he proved a very nice uh, effective statement. So it's a, a very nice statement. Very so he showed that in the th situation of the theorem, the theorem 1 holds uh, as soon as, so he gives, I think it's essentially the best possible, holds as soon as, uh, I think it's the best possible statement more or less. So as soon as h1 of L equals h1 of L minus B equals 0. So what that means is that the ganality conjecture holds, so ganality, ganality holds essentially for degree at least something like 4G. So I think we had gotten some statement that was like G cubed or something. But this is, I think, essentially the best possible. So that's a very nice. Um, now, what, ha what can you say? What can you say? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is theorem 1. There are not going to be that many theorems, right? There's only one more. So here's theorem 2. So what can you say if you're uh, not if you're not in this p-very ample situation. So if b is funny, has funny divisors. Well, OK, so then uh, so theorem 2 is let's assume that b, b is, doesn't satisfy this condition. So assume that b is not, um, I hate this word, p-very ample, but anyway. OK. So assume that this, or this, some divisors of degree p plus 1. Well, then you can count how many funny divisors of degree p plus 1 there are. So let's introduce a name for that. So let's set uh, gamma, uh, how do I want to do it? Gamma sub p of b to be the dimension of the set inside the symmetric product, c inside the symmetric product, so that the map, hmm, how am I going to do this? Well, the map from h naught of b to h naught of b tensor, this map is not surjective. So it's some kind of uh, degeneracy locus. So this is the thing that counts the dimension of the set at which this condition fails. And then uh, the statement is, uh, right, so the statement then is that, uh, this, so that we know that then the kp1 the KP of b with respect to LD will be non-zero, but the claim is that it grows for large D as a polynomial of that degree. Okay, so um, okay, so the claim is that then. Okay, so the claim is that then, then for D B, then for D very large, uh, this the dimension of K P one of B with respect to LD is a polynomial in D of that degree. So it, it rate of, uh, so it measures the rate of growth of these groups. Now the answer is Sasha's question, so can you control the size of these things? So not in general, but if, you know, if you're in the range where there's basically some, altern some basically the alternating sum, if only one of them is non-zero, it's an Euler characteristic, but in general, these aren't Euler characteristics, so it's hard to. OK. So um, as I say, this is kind of a weird story. So it turned out that the, the purloined letter aspect of this is that it turns out that the, the, the conjecture is basically a trivial consequence, a trivial, a tiny little variant of the things, some of the ideas that Claire used. So well, both of them, but theorem one in particular. OK. So let's see. So this is uh, so. Let me now talk about Kazuo cohomology and symmetric products. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So what was the idea? So as you probably know, Claire uh, wanted to study the syzygies of general canonical curves, and so the idea is that if you take a, a K3 surface of Picard number one, its hyperplane sections are supposed to behave like general canonical curves, so you could try to compute the syzygies of a K3 surface. And so what she did is she interpreted that in terms of the Hilbert scheme and then computed for 30 pages and 
got what you wanted to. But the point is that the, if you just make a tiny little variant of the interpretation of the Hilbert scheme, this kind of pops out. So let me kind of explain. I can more or less probably prove the whole thing in detail. So there's, a, first of all, a lemma that there's a kind of a way to compute these syzygy groups with what's called Kazool cohomology. So uh, let's see. So KP1, let me call it, uh, well, lemma. I don't want to number it. B with respect to LD is the cohomology of a Kazool type complex. Uh, and what is the Kazool type complex? So let me leave a little room over here. So you have wedge P plus 1 H naught of L times H naught of L plus B, uh, H naught of B. And that goes to wedge P H, it's a Kazool type complex, times H naught of B plus L. And then this goes to H uh, wedge P minus 1, H naught of L tensor H naught of uh, B plus 2L. So you peel off one, when you take a wedge of P plus 1 sections of L, you peel off one and you multiply. And this explains the indexing is here. We have 1L. So we, this KPQ would be defined similarly with QLs there. So that's how the gradient goes. So this is kind of. This is, this is a general fact. So it's completely general. Um, OK. I mean, again, and so Dan, if you want, you can prove the duality. Apply sphere duality to each piece, if you, if you like. Um, OK. So this is a well-known. OK. So when you actually play with these things. What? OK. <laughs> well, I'll never know what a chase scheme is. So <laughs> I guess we're even. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, now, you see, when you play with these things, if you actually play with these things, the, the thing that, so these are all computations on the curve. But what makes these things kind of slightly miserable is you have these high wedge products. And so the idea here is that if you go to a Hilbert scheme, or in our case, a symmetric product, you can trade the wedge product for a line bundle, H naught of a line bundle, at the expense of going to higher dimensions. So now what we'll do is let's consider uh, Cp plus 1. So this is the symmetric product. Okay, And uh, then if we have a line bundle, uh, then there are two some standard constructions one makes here. A line bundle B on C, this gives rise to a tautological vector bundle of rank p plus 1 on this symmetric product. So it gives a vector bundle eb, or e, maybe I should throw in the p plus 1, b of rank p plus 1 on this symmetric product. And well, the easiest way is just to tell you what the fibers are. So the fiber, the fiber of this vector bundle at a point p, uh, so what, what should I say here? So the fiber of this thing, fiber of this E sub B at a divisor C, is just, uh, I just evaluate the sections of B tensor O C. So this is a rank P plus 1 vector space. So that they fit together to form a vector bundle. And of course, then I have an evaluation map. So I have an evaluation map that takes the trivial bundle with sections of B to this E P plus 1 B. And uh, so this is a map of vector bundles. So just, uh, and now the point is that uh, this as a map of vector bundles, by definition, this is surjective if and only if this bundle B is P very ample. So this is surjective as a vector bundle map uh, if and only if P B is what is this P, P very ample. I should say, the only way that this really differs from what Claire did is she didn't actually work on the Hilbert scheme. She worked on a statement above the, on the universal family. And so I think, uh, uh, so the advantage of working downstairs is you, this, you know, this, this, the picture there is, uh, you see this right away. Okay. okay. Now, the next player is uh, if we have a line bundle, given a line bundle L on our C, 
then we can introduce again, I'm, this is, these are not standard notations, but we can look at the determinant of this E sub L. And this has the, again, it's kind of well known, the, the nice thing about this, so this is the thing that if you, people look at to embed Hilbert schemes in Grassmannians. So the fact is that, the, see, if you take wedge product, if you take the wedge P plus one of this, that you get wedge P plus one H of B mapping to this, or what I would call N sub B, and uh, the point is that then uh, H naught on this P plus one of this line bundle is our friend wedge P plus one H naught L. So again, this is Claire proved this, but this is rather a standard fact. So you see, uh, things are starting to look a little bit Kazulish here. So uh, now let's look at, uh, okay. So you see, what we've done is we've we at the expense of passing to higher dimensions, we replace these wedge products by sections of a line bundle. So that's that's good. Okay. Now the next step is to consider. Uh, let's consider this. Let's put these two things together. So uh, let's consider. Let's take this bundle E sub B and tensor by this line bundle N sub L. Now who maps to this? Well, E sub B. Uh, uh, e sub b is a quotient of the trivial uh, well, maps. I have a map from an evaluation map from E sub b tensor uh, nl, and then uh, the sections of n. So h naught of E sub b maps to E sub of b, and uh, wedge p plus one h naught of l maps to sections of l, uh, sections of nl. So I put these two things together. I get sections h naught of b tensor h naught of l that maps to. Um, H naught of, so I'm, let me, I'm saying, I want to consider this thing. So I get a map here to H naught of E B tensor N L. Okay. And so this is looking kind of familiar. See, this is the thing that's coming in. This is the incoming group in that Kazul complex. And so the basic thing that Claire proves, so the next lemma, which is due to voisin, is that. Uh, the sections of this EB tensor NL are actually the cycles for this Kazul complex. So, uh, uh, so the next lemma, and again, this was the uh, kind of the crucial computation that Claire made, is that uh, the sections, the sections of that thing, in general, this is the group of Kazul cycles. So it's the the Kazul cycles. It's the ZP1 of B uh, with respect to L. So this is the cycles in the Kazul in the Kazul complex. That's right, right. So this is the kernel of the, the out. So uh, this is the incoming map, and the thing that's standing there is the kernel. Okay, so what does that mean we need to show? So uh, so uh, so therefore what that means is that uh, okay? So in other words, so uh, so uh, K P one is zero if and only if this map from H naught of B. Uh, uh, let me let me yeah yeah l let me give this a name. So if and only if this map star is surjective. Okay, so let's uh, prove that it's subjective and then call it quits. Okay, so this is kind of so <laughs> Okay, so let's see why it's, let's uh, finish the proof. Okay, so uh, proof of theorem. Okay, so again, there's an if and only a statement, but the serious direction is to show that if the B has satisfies this period very ample condition, then the syzygy group vanishes. So let's assume that B is this P very ample. So what does that mean? So what that means is that if I take this evaluation map, uh, this maps on to E sub B. So the surjectivity as a vector bundle map is the same thing as this p variable. So let me give a name to the kernel. So 
And let me let M be the kernel. So it's a kernel bundle. So it's a, an M bundle. OK. And now let me twist this whole thing by N sub L. OK, so what do we need to say? So we're trying to say that the map on global sections here is surjective when L has sufficiently large degree. So, uh, so it's enough to show that if the degree of L is very large, then uh, the H1 of this M, so let me, well, M tensor N sub L is 0. OK, well, what's the easy way that something can have can kill cohomology if the degree of L is very large. So the only point left to observe is that these n's, as L gets more and more positive, these n sub L's satisfy Sayre vanishing. So uh, uh, the n sub L, these line bundles, as L gets more positive, the n sub L's are getting more positive. So these n sub L's satisfy Sayre vanishing. In other words, i.e. Given any, given any coherent sheaf f, uh, there exists some integer d naught of f, uh, so that if the degree of L is greater than or equal to this d naught, then uh, the, H the higher cohomology of f tensor, these n sub L's, vanishes. And this, you can just compute them. I mean, the L's are getting more, the N's are, you just compute what they are, and they're getting more and more positive. And so that's it. So uh, because it's p-variant ample, this is surjective as a map of vector bundles. The twist by NL, the Claire's lemma says that you need to kill the H1 of this, and you check that these satisfy Sayre vanishing. So that's it. Now, you might ask, where are we using the fact that it's a curve rather than higher dimensions? So the setup would work in all dimensions. But this lemma is not true on surfaces. There is, uh, I mean, this on higher dimensions if you work with the Hilbert scheme, because there's a, basically there's a Hilbert Chow morphism. And the L's are getting more positive, the N sub L's are getting more positive on Chow, and you need a vanishing on Hilb. But there is a statement with David Yang and Lawrence uh, Ein. We proved a statement in all dimensions, but it's a little bit less satisfying because the condition involves vanishing in terms of positivity in terms of jets instead of in terms of schemes of a given length. So, Somebody wants at the end, I can state that, but it's not quite as satisfying. It's not if and only if. So I'll stop there. <laughs>